What's up, hobby friends? In this video, I'm going to be showing you how I painted the new stand for my subway board for Marvel Crisis Protocol. I'm going to move very quickly through the painting process as that's not really my primary focus. I do briefly talk about how I painted each of the different areas and how I chose the colors I chose. But really what I want to focus on is the use of easy weathering techniques like sponge chip weathering and then using things like oils and enamels to very quickly and very easily weather up and paint this terrain piece for the tabletop. So the first step is to prime the model and we're going to be using Vallejo's Surface Primer Black run through the airbrush. Make sure that using a larger needle for this as it'll help to cover the surface area much more quickly and uh, easily. I'm using the 0.4 millimeter needle in the airbrush. Um, alternatively, if you want to use a rattle can, you can also do that as well. Once the primer is dry, we can then move on to the next step to airbrush some of the major colors on. Because this isn't going to be a display piece, it's for the tabletop, and we're going to be leaning on weathering and using oils and enamels to do a lot of our shading. Um, panel lining and special effects. We're going to keep this painting process relatively simple and straightforward. So uh, simple two-tone blends, uh, nothing crazy. We have a very simple color scheme picked up for this. We're going to be using a neutral gray for a lot of the, um, the edging and some of the trim to represent the metallic elements. And then we're going to contrast that with a sort of mid-tone green maybe a green aqua color i have a few picked out and then we'll see how we uh, feel as we're mixing the colors up and then we'll uh, spray that onto some of the inset panels so for example here on the roof uh, the new stand sign uh, the door the shutters as well as this back panel here to reinforce the dark shadow on the inside we're going to be spraying rubber black which is a uh, a warm tone dark gray slightly off black and we'll be spraying that on the inside and we'll also uh, be painting the magazine stand and vending machine with that. We're going to sequence it to allow for the quickest airbrushing and minimal masking. So we're going to start with the gray and then we're going to move to our green tones. And we're going to use the rubber black for some of the in-between panels and lines, um, framing the door as well as the shutter to allow for the masking to be a little less precise. So we have the basic colors airbrushed on our new stand and we've airbrushed the green, but before we remove the masking tape, what we actually want to do is we want to apply our chip and sponge weathering. In this way, we can sort of be messy, especially around the edges of the green and not worry about getting the sponging onto any other elements, particularly on the roof and on the panels here where it's adjacent to any gray. So for this, we're just going to be using a pair of tweezers and some foam. Now when you buy models, especially some of the older um, manufacturers from Games Workshop or Infinity or whatever, or if you buy um, bus from like Nuts Planet or whatever, they'll come with these foam inserts. Uh, they're very, very stiff and what you do is just peel off a bit of a corner. You're looking for rough patches and rough sides. And then we're just going to use a bit of whole red, but really any sort of brownie red will do. Dip it in our palette, get most of the paint off, so it's almost like uh, the start of a dry brush. And we can test a little bit of a sponging on the palette. We're looking for these cool splotchy patterns. And we're just going to go ahead and focus on where some of the damage would naturally occur. You can go as heavy or as light as you would like, depending on how worn or how clean you want this to be. So with the uh, painter's tape removed, you can see that we have now the clean separation between the gray and the green, clean edges. We're going to use our sponge burner technique and do the exact same thing only to the gray. We're using medium C gray from Vallejo, which is just a touch brighter than graphite. And what we're looking to do is just do the exact same sort of subtle chipping to the gray. Now, we could have done this before we did all the masking and uh, airbrush the green, especially if the gray was going to be a lot brighter and have some uh, more noticeable chips. But this gray on the graphite isn't super strong. And if we get a little over chipping onto the green, it's actually not too bad. It's a little bit of an extra layer of weathering. So 
I'm not too overly concerned about being um, too neat with this and also why I'm doing it at this step now rather than before we did the masking and green painting. So we're going to go ahead and we're just going to do the entire uh, sponge weathering over the gray elements, focusing around the edges and corners where um, the, nat the damage would naturally occur. Once again, just like the green, we can go as heavy or as light as you want. And because this is supposed to be a bit more of a, a brushed metal surface, not super reflective, um, but in terms of the way the damage would occur on this material, you don't have to limit yourself to just dabbing for the sponging. You could also lightly drag the sponge across and create these streaks, almost like we're dry brushing with the sponge. Let's move it in random patterns and just try and create some interesting textures and details. Once again, uh, there's no reason to spend too much time on this. This is a tabletop piece. If you do want to polish it up and maybe use this for something more of a display, you can spend a little more time refining this. I'm just going to go quick and dirty and try and get this done in a single sitting. So to paint the window, we're going to be using a dark blue and a medium blue. So for this, I'm using EK's dark sea blue and gray blue. And we're going to start with a base coat of the dark sea blue. I'm just going to make sure that we're going to get a nice even coverage over the entire window. Now, the reason that we're going to be doing this first before painting the trim is that we can be a little messy with this, um, particularly because we're going to be using wet blending. Um, if you're going to be doing this a different uh, manner, particularly if you're going to be using the airbrush, then maybe you want to go in and mask some of the elements or I think I'm higher of you wish. This is the way I'm choosing to do them. So once we've got our base coat down and while the dark sea blue is still a little wet, starting from the top left corner, and mainly we're focusing on the top with the highlights coming down in the this way direction, top left to bottom right at a bit of an angle, mixing in a bit of our medium blue, and we're just going to start applying it in. Now, if your dark sea blue dries too quickly, or if you wanna um, keep working the blend, just mix in a bit of that dark sea blue. Now, once again, depending on how comfortable you feel with wet blending, if you have a technique that you're more comfortable with, uh, paint it however you want. Really, we're just looking to get a very simple medium to dark fade, nothing too bright. We don't want the windows to look super cartoony. I'm choosing to leave a lot of my textures in here, and this is going to help to sell the effect that, um, one, it is hand-painted. I, I like that textural feel to having the brush strokes in there, but also perhaps there's dirt or there's grime, there's imperfections in the glass, there's reflections happening. Really, I'm just playing around with what's being seen here, what information I'm conveying, and I'm using this painterly style to add a bit more information and a bit more life to this with texture. Once you're happy with the blend and while it's still drying, we're gonna take our uh, pure gray blue. We're gonna dilute it. And then in the opposite corner, so from the bottom right, focusing mainly on this corner right here. And we're gonna bring it up just a little bit on the bottom left. We're gonna paint a line leaving a gap between the highlight and the border. Essentially what this is, is this is the um, light refraction through the glass panel. So we have the diffuse highlight coming in from the top left, and then our light reflection uh, coming in on the bottom right. So with diluted paint, 
uh, thin down dilution and a very uh, sharp brush tip. We're just going to very gently paint in this highlight. Once again, make sure you leave a bit of a border between the highlight and the edge of the window. Once that's done, we're going to take pure dark sea blue diluted, and then we're just going to lightly glaze in over this line, just on the edges to help fade it back. We'll do a couple of thin coats. And that's the window done. We'll repeat that process for the other two windows. So with the windows done, we're now going to jump to our Tenebus Gray, which is a dark purplish gray tone. And we're going to start painting some of these trims and details lining like the windows here, uh, the windows over here, uh, lining the door, uh, the newsstand sign, the backing on the roof. And the reason why we're not using rubber black again, we're using Tenebris Gray, is just to introduce a bit of variety in the gray tones. So that even if the, the two are similar in um, value, the, the difference in the colors will help create that little extra tonal variety. And once again, because we're leaning heavily on our um, oils and enamels uh, down the road, we're just gonna keep this nice and simple, doing a nice clean base coat. The last thing that we're really going to be painting with the acrylics is the lettering. So we have a new stand on the side here, as well as the panels on the roof. So they're going to be painted the same way. So I'll show it to you on one side. I'll paint a few letters and then we'll um, cut to the next step. So we're going to start with four colors. We're going to be using uh, a mid-tone gray. We're using our AK graphite. And then we're going to be highlighting by mixing in progressive amounts of khaki. So I'm using our brown, Mojave white, and white sands from scale 75. Uh, the colors themselves don't really matter. It all just depends on how you want the letters to look. So we're going to start with our graphite and just lay down a base coat on the letters. Essentially, the goal is to do... Um, not quite a pure white, but almost an off-white. Okay, so once that's dry, we'll take some Thar Brown, we'll mix it into our graphite, and then we'll highlight the letters. I'm just applying a simple top-down highlight. And then we're just going to be repeating the process, mixing our way progressively through the, uh, the different khaki colors until we hit pure white sands. Now, depending on where the lettering is, so either on the front, the side, or the back, you may want to go brighter or darker with this. So I'm going to have new stand on the front, the brightest, mid-tone on the side, and darker in the back, just to have that bit of directional, oops, directional highlighting and shading but also to make my job easier so I don't have to do so many layers. And honestly, it's um, you don't have to be super neat with this. Once we get to our oils and enamel step, this will get fairly dirty. So there's no reason to, to worry about being super smooth, super neat. Just paint within the lines of the letters. Okay, so once we've gotten the pure thar brown, we start mixing Mojave white. you can see that with each progressive layer I do, I'm highlighting less and less and leaving more of the darker layers on the bottom.
Now we finish with pure white sands. Now, once I hit the pure white sands, I'm also going to focus a bit of edge highlighting on the top surfaces. And it's that little bit of detail that adds that nice touch to it, gives it that pop. And we're going to do the same for all the lettering. So we've gotten the new stand, the basic acrylic colors painted in. Uh, you can see that I've also added a bit of an employee's only sign on the door just for a little bit of extra detail. When we're first looking at this, it does seem a little dark, um, especially with all the uh, grays that we have going on. But it's important to remember that we're going to be adding a bit more of, of color with our weathering with our oil paints, and then we're gonna be having uh, newspaper and magazine clippings are gonna cover these stands right here. So between those, I think that's gonna be plenty of color and detail. We don't want it to be too busy. I think this uh, simple little paint job is sufficient. Now, before we proceed to the next step, I do wanna cover just very, very briefly on the topic of oils and enamels. So you're going to need to have a couple of materials if we're going to be using these. And the first, of course, is the oils and enamel paints. I'm using for this project a burnt sienna and Payne's Gray from Van Gogh and from a Georgian for the Payne's Gray. But you can get brands uh, like Windsor Newton is pretty good. Um, depending on what your budget is, you can go even higher in terms of the grade or the quality of the oil paints. These, I think, are fairly entry level. They're fairly inexpensive. I got them at a, uh, I don't want to say discount art store, but it's a University of Toronto art store that does discounts for students. So these were about $8 for a tube, and this is honestly going to last me for forever. So fairly inexpensive. And then we also have a couple of AK enamels. So I've got some uh, yellow dust. I've got a streak and grime, some rust and then a neutral wash gray for this project specifically. Oils and enamels can be quite harsh on brushes and you want to avoid using the same sort of Kalinsky sable brushes or uh, animal hair brushes that you might use for acrylics. So for working with these kind of materials, we have a range of synthetic brushes. Now I'm using a couple of art store ones, a fan brush for doing dot weathering and uh, just brushing over large surfaces for a bit of a texture. I've got an old Raphael, fairly cheap, that I just use to mix the oil paints. So I don't care if I damage the brush, the tip, or the ferrule. It's not sharp, so it's not really for accuracy. And then I have a couple of Green Stuff World synthetic brushes. I have really good tips. This is a size one and two that we use for our detail work and painting. Oil paints themselves aren't necessarily toxic. It's just pigments and linseed enamels are. And then we're going to be thinning both of these with turpentine or uh, some sort of odorless solvent. And this is toxic. So when we are painting, it's important to remember one, because we're using this to thin and also clean our brushes, don't use water. And then if you're a brush licker like me, don't lick your brushes. Um, we're gonna be using a couple of metal containers, a few to create our oil and enamel mixes. And then we're gonna use one with just clean uh, mineral spirits as a way to clean our brush in between swapping for colors. And then one final note on prep. So if you've ever, ever used oils before, you know that you can use a gloss varnish or even a satin varnish to help break the surface tension and allow the enamels and oils to flow much more smoothly, get into the crevices and to be able to erase. I'm gonna forego this step on this miniature specifically mainly because what we're gonna be doing for this doesn't require too much erasing. And um, these specific enamels and the oil paint, once we dilute it enough, we'll get into the crevices and cracks, no problem. There's not a lot of surface detail here that I need to worry about. If you are concerned about being able to go back in, correct, um, and maybe potentially erase uh, or tweak after the oils have dried, then you're gonna to wanna to go ahead and airbrush 
or spray a coat or two of gloss varnish to get this to be uh, very, very shiny and smooth. So I'm prepping the Payne's Gray wash now. And as you can see, you don't really need a lot of paint, um, especially for a wash, depending on how heavy or um, how intense you need the color to be. Because we're looking to just um, define the creases and do a little bit of a, a surface shading on there. Not too much pigment, just a little bit. And then we're going to pour in our mineral spirits. Now, if you want to be more accurate with it, you can use something like a, an eyedropper. Something like this. Um, if you're worried about uh, precision in terms of measurements, or if you want to have a, a specific recipe in mind or a ratio, I tend to just eyeball it. And then once that's mixed up, the wash is prepared. So with the wash prepared, we now go into painting using our fine detail brush. And all we're going to be using is capillary action. You can see how just by taking a brush loaded with the oil and dipping it in the crevices, it's pulling the color and the pigment all along without really doing much effort. Now, because we want this new stand to be a little dirty, it pooling along the surface isn't a big deal. Um, when it dries, it will dry a little lighter than what you see with the uh, when it's first wet. And then as it's drying, if you pay attention to it, um, if you want to sort of adjust or correct along the way, you can take some clean mineral spirits and you can push it around while it is still drying. And again, if um, correcting uh, long term after it is dried, but before you seal it with some sort of uh, matte finish, you can always just go back in with a or start with a coat of gloss varnish up the surface. Now what I'm doing right now is I'm just taking some clean mineral spirits and I'm just wetting the entire panel. It helps smooth out some of that transition if there are any um, of the, the oil pigments along the edge and to prevent any of those tide marks that you might see sometimes. And we repeat this process for the entire new stand. So with the Payne's Gray oil wash done, it's now time to go on to the next step. Now you can see here that I've cut out um, a couple of graphics. Some of these are gonna be placed on before we do our enamels, and some of them will be placed afterwards. The method that we're gonna to use to apply both of them is the same, and the reason that we're doing the sequencing a little different is the stuff that we're doing before the enamels is uh, signage or propaganda posters that have been on the walls and have been subject to the same kind of weathering and the same kind of wear that the rest of the new stand has. So things like uh, business hours, uh, help wanted, like in the aforementioned propaganda posters, um, they've been on there for a while. They're gonna see that same wear and tear. The newspapers um, and magazine clippings that we're gonna go on afterwards are probably rotated on a fairly regular basis. They're gonna be handled. They're gonna be in a much better condition and not have the same sort of wear and tear as this stuff will. Although we might go in after we apply it and just do a little bit of, of dusting with maybe some of the yellow, just to age it up a little bit. So for this step, all we're gonna be using is some PVA glue or Mod Podge, clean water, an old brush, and then I'm using some squeeze to open tweezers to help me apply the graphics more precisely. Uh, you can do it by hand if you want. It's up to you. What you're going to want to do is just take your PVA glue or Mod Podge, apply it to the area that you want to apply the graphic to. And if you want to preemptively have the graphic in your tweezers, we'll just do that. So we'll do the business hours on the external door. And 
and then we'll do because this is paper and when we apply the enamels it may absorb some of that uh, that paint we want to go back in and give the paper another coat of the mod podge or pva this will help seal it and protect it from the next step In the case of, so let's say I want to put a propaganda poster on this textured surface and it is rigged and I want the poster to adhere to the entire surface and not just sit on top with gaps underneath. We're going to apply it the same way, but instead of applying the um, poster dry, we're going to dip it in water and sort of PVA it onto the surface. Now, I like using the Mod Podge over PVA because it dries clear and without any sort of the, the residual uh, layering that PVA we sometimes has. That's enough water. And then while that's wet, we just go back in with some of our Mod Podge water down so that it'll help to soften up the paper and we'll just brush it over. And then we just set that aside to dry. So now that the uh, propaganda posters and the initial uh, stuff that we put on in terms of detailing has been fully dried. We're going to be moving on to our enamels. So much like the oils, we're going to have a little container for clean mineral spirits. And then I also have a wash container. Now this is for cleaning the brush. And it's important to keep these two separate because you don't want to muddy your colors. So typically my process is as I'm using enamels, I will clean with this brush or this, uh, this container. And for the most part, that gets most or the majority of the enamels off the brush. If I need to go in with clean mineral spirits to actually clean up or refine anything on the figure or the model, I will use the clean mineral spirits here because this will have color in it. If you try and use this to clean around, you're just going to end up muddying the detail here. So um, there's no real set order that we do this in, or that you have to do this in. Mineral spirits is a really easy way to erase and correct and tweak enamels, much like oils. You can go back in while it's still wet or even just as it's drying and correct, erase, sharpen. It's very forgiving. And because the dry time and the, the set time does take a, quite a while, you actually have a lot of leeway to work with this product, this material. So don't feel too rushed. Um, have fun with it. It's supposed to be organic and you're going to end up going back and forth, adding and removing and tweaking detail as you go. So the first one that we're going to start with, and I'm going to demonstrate a little bit, is with the streaking grime. Now I like this color because it's a good way to add a bit of that initial dirt and grime. It's not quite as intense as a rust color, but it's a good way to add a little bit of dirtiness. And you can see that I've started on here just to demonstrate a little bit. So when we lay the enamels down, we just take it with our brush. You don't need too much. And let's say we just put some streaks here. All right, just be very, very quick, very loose with it. I'll put a couple around this poster here. So let's say we now wanna go in and we want to refine a little bit of this. Maybe this, we wanna thin it up a little bit. I'm gonna take some clean mineral spirits. And we're just going to brush it along. You see how we're sort of um, using that uh, clean mineral spirits to erase a bit of the intensity. Now, if you want to extend the working time a little more and be able to erase more easily, again, I recommend you do a coat of gloss varnish before you do this. This will make the erasing step much easier. So you see how on the poster, because we have that coat of Mod Podge on there that acts as a bit of a gloss varnish, how easy it is to go back in and tweak and erase. So let's say, for example, we find this entire line too heavy. We'll just go ahead and go back in with some mineral spirits 
and we'll just erase it. Then it out, dilute it, push it around. So the rust streaks is applied very much the same way. This is a much more intense ready brown color. And we're going to be focusing on where the chipping is. And we're going to apply the rust in much the same manner. We're going to bring it down, pulling from the rust streaks. Now you want a sharper brush for this one. You want to be a little more deliberate and um, precise with this. Again, there's the ability to erase, but you want intense lines of color to have that really strong rust color. Now, the reason I also have this burnt sienna color, this oil paint, uh, this is much more intense, and I can control the intensity compared to these enamels. These enamels straight out of the jar are fairly diluted, and they're more for, for nuancing and for light applications. If you really want a heavy, intense rust line, um, I highly recommend dipping into the oils. The application is exactly the same, but because you can adjust the dilution yourself, you can go really intense with just the pigments. So you can see I've got some of this burnt sienna in my uh, little container. Unlike the Payne's Gray where we mixed it thoroughly to create a wash, I'm not going to mix this. I'm going to use the mineral spirits in here as a way to just keep it moist and to help pull and dilute as I go. And I'm going to have a clump of pure pigment um, or pure oil paint in the center. What we're going to do is we're just going to take a bit of the oil, a bit of the wetness, and dilute it as much as we need. And with it loaded on the brush, we can go back in. I'm going to do the back as an example. Right, and because I can actually take the pure pigment, uh, the pure oil paint, sorry, and literally just apply it to the model, I can get a much stronger, a much more intense color to the rust that I couldn't get from the enamel. So this is really good for laying down some old um, faded effects, but I find that having oil paints on hand to really bump up the intensity saturation for, for brighter colors, really useful. And much like the enamels, we can go back in with mineral spirits and we can just reactivate to refine, to touch up, to clean, to pull out. Now, when you apply the oil paints thick like this, with pure color, this will take quite a long time to dry. Um, this will probably take, I would say, three to four days to actually fully set. Um, and even then, you can go back in with wet mineral spirits and you can reactivate. So I can go back in two or three days from now. Um, Find I may want to tweak or adjust this oil color, and I can go back in with mineral spirits and still probably work it um, even more easily so if you have a layer of gloss varnish on top. Because I haven't varnished this, um, it will set a little quicker. The working time won't carry as long. So probably in, I would say, two days, maybe three, it'll basically be set and I won't be able to work it as much, and then it'll fully dry within another day or two, and then I can actually varnish the entire piece. So something like this sand yellow uh, dust and deposit enamel color is really good for creating buildup of um, sort of weathering and dust in corners where you might not necessarily want to use a dry pigment. Um, those don't set as easily. Um, they rub off on your hands and they're much harder to apply, especially in crevices. So if we want to do a little bit of a buildup, let's say on the base of this door, just take our enamel. And we can just gently apply it in there. If we have a, a loaded brush with it and we've used a bit of gloss varnish, uh, we can also also lean on some capillary action. Okay. 
And when you're applying these uh, weathering effects, really think through how this weather is happening. Um, you don't want to be applying dust everywhere, but think about where the dust would actually deposit and collect on something that maybe doesn't see a lot of use or where it would naturally fall down on top of. And that's where, where you're applying the color. Think of the story that you're trying to tell. And then, just like before, if we want to correct or if we want to pull this out a little bit, we can just use a bit of mineral spirits. And it's important to also point out that you want to make sure you're giving each layer of the enamels or the oils sufficient time to dry or to set before moving on to the next layer. So typically what I will do is I will use the enamels first because they dry the fastest. So I can probably apply a layer and then maybe within like um, five or 10 minutes, it'll have set and I can go in and apply on top of it without worrying about adjusting the uh, layer beneath. That's also why I haven't glossed varnished this piece. It, um, yes, I get less working time with the enamels, but it also means that um, because they dry faster, I can move quicker with these layers without having to wait an inordinate amount of time for them to fully dry. So for example, on this enamel layer that's already been previously applied, if I go back in with clean mineral spirits now, it's been probably a good five minutes, it's set. Like I'm not able to do anything to it, um, except for maybe, maybe gently reducing the color a little bit. So what that means is I can apply the layer, move over the entire piece um, with my streaking grime, and then by the time I come back to the door, it'll all be dry. I can go back in with my rust, do another pass. And then by the time I come back to the door, I can then do the dust. I'll do that for all the enamels. Make sure all the enamels are dry first. And then I will jump to the oils. Because as I'm working on the oils, I don't want to then go back in, do enamels on top, and risk reactivating the oils. So enamels first, oil second, and then the oils will probably, depending on how you apply them, take three or four days to maybe even a week to fully set. You want to be able to work, work the piece over as quickly as possible and then set it aside to dry. And so we'll carry on that process over the entire newsstand, uh, working our way through each of the different textures and just adding that little bit of information. And you can see without too much effort or work, it doesn't take a lot of time. We can get some really great looking detail onto what was otherwise a, a simple two-tone or even just a one-tone uh, base coat. Because we're going to be applying a lot of our newspapers and magazines decals uh, onto this part of the model and onto the back, I'm probably not going to spend as much time on these parts. So the last bit of detail that we want to apply to this model is the uh, newspaper and magazine uh, cutouts or decals that we're going to be putting on the stand here. And the process is the same as when we were doing the posters. We're just using a bit of our Mod Podge or PVA glue and a brush and some tweezers. And we're gonna take this one at a time. The way I want them arranged is I want two rows of magazines and newspapers slotted into here and here. I'm gonna have a thinner row of magazines right in the front and then a row of the newspapers and magazines down here. We'll go ahead and glue that in and then we'll see how we feel about maybe uh, leaving the back part blank. One thing I do wanna make sure is I'm balancing out the amount of color and detail that's gonna end up in the front here with how busy it's gonna end up looking in the back. Remember that this is gonna be covered. A lot of this won't be seen. And so we want a nice bit of uh, empty blank space or the black space to balance or offset how busy this part will end up being. And we're just going one sheet at a time using a bit of, of Mod Podge to where the newspaper will insert. If it overlaps a little bit, we'll make sure we Mod Podge the sheet beside it. And 
And we just repeat that process for the entire front. So with all of the newspapers and magazines now glued in, the Mod Podge is dry. It's now time to finish the assembly of the new stand and then we're gonna set it aside for probably about a week for the oil to fully dry. Once that has all set, I'm gonna go back in with some purity seal or some matte varnish, spray the entire thing, and our new stand is complete. So I hope you enjoyed the video and I hope the breakdown and the ability to use oils and enamels opens up a world of possibilities for you to very quickly and very easily paint up larger pieces like tanks and terrain for your own armies and tabletop. If you enjoyed the video, don't forget to give it a like and subscribe for more awesome videos every week. If you want to check out my other social platforms, I'll also make sure to drop a link in the video description below. Until next time, happy hobbying.